Good evening, friends. Grace and peace to you. Welcome to Sunday Sit 6 worship this evening or this morning or this afternoon or whenever it is that you're worshiping with us. I'm welcoming you into the second week of our new series called Freedom Songs on the book of Exodus. That phrase is inspired by the civil rights movement and the phrase that was used to describe the marching music that many of these leaders would use as they marched for the cause of freedom. Right now, we are thinking a lot about freedom and we are thinking alongside the book of Exodus this summer, the second part of the summer as the days get hot. And also as we think about when will we be able to gather freely and safely again as a people. But until then, we are going to be continuing to meet from our homes or our boats or our backyards or our daycare centers or a little bit of um, spare time at our desks. And so I'm so glad that you are here with me and all of those who are leading worship today. Couple of announcements. We have some studies that are starting. Um, Be the bridge and a new study called The Will of God. These are both going to be online on Zoom, The Will of God, on Monday morning at 1030. And Be the Bridge every other Wednesday evening. This Wednesday is one of those at 7 p.m. If you'd like a book for that, you can email me. It's Christina T at rightsfulumc.org. Or if you want more interest in the Will of God study, if you want more info, I should say, you can email Donna at rightsfulumc.org. We also are practicing this month the, the practice of Sabbath, the spiritual practice of Sabbath. And so we would love you to join in. Sabbath is just literally to stop, to take a break for rest and worship and doing things that feed your body and feed your soul. And if you'd like to learn more about Sabbath, you can check out the Wrightsville UMC Facebook page or YouTube channel. And there is a deep dive from Reverend Carol Gehring in which she's digging deep into it, working with us about exploring what does it mean to practice Sabbath. And last but not least, we are going to be celebrating Holy Communion as part of our renewed rhythm here at Sundays at Six. It's something that when we meet in person, we have every week. We celebrate communion because we believe that this is part of this sacrament. It renews us and helps us to fill up with the presence of Christ for the coming week. This is a weird time, and so we are celebrating Holy Communion virtually. And so we'd like to invite you to maybe pause this video or to run real quick and grab a piece of bread or a cracker or a little bit of juice or wine so that you can celebrate with us this sacrament in which we share in the body and blood of Christ, even while we are socially distant. And last but not least, we would love to encourage you to keep giving. We know that things are tight right now and they may be getting even tighter as the weeks and the months go on. And so we are so grateful that you are here. We are so grateful that you continue to worship with us and that you continue to give. We have an online VBS that is starting its third week, its third and final week. And next Sunday, we are going to be celebrating in our Sunday morning worship some of our songs with our VBS kids. But we couldn't do this without you, without you continuing to give. And so we are so grateful. Because you continue to give, it's how we can keep having Sundays at 6 and compensating our musicians. It's how we can keep having morning worship. It's how we can keep mission and outreach going and small groups and youth and children and all of the things we do. And so we are just um, want to thank you for how you keep giving. Now, friends, I invite you to take a breath in. And let's pray together. God of Moses and Miriam. God of Pharaoh's daughter and Moses' mother. God of Zipporah and her sisters, God of us. We thank you that you call us to sing and to listen to your song of freedom. God, be with us in these next few minutes in our speaking and in our listening. And may the words of my mouth 
and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 2. Now a man in the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she couldn't hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it in tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me. I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have been known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the, the troughs of, to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Raoul, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flocks. And where is he? he asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Grisham, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. There are these times, maybe once or twice if we're lucky, in our lives in which everything seems to come together, to coalesce, and we think, oh, this is what I'm here for. Moses' mother and his sister Miriam, a daughter of Pharaoh whose name we don't know, <laughs> a baby boy in a basket, Maybe it was one of those moments, or maybe they didn't see it that way at the time. This scripture that Bonnie read so beautifully earlier in our service is one of these with a thousand, it seems, cast of characters. <laughs> the cast of Ben-Hur, one of our staff has said sometimes. Person after person after person that all seem to come together in just the right way at just the right time to get everybody to where they need to be in the story. 
I can't help but think that it's the same way with baby Moses traveling down the Nile in a basket. A little ark, as some theologians say. That's the word that's used in the Hebrew. A little ark carrying Moses through the waters, hopefully to safety, just as God carried Noah and Noah's family and all those animals. Moses' mother conceived and bore a son. When she saw that Moses was a fine baby, she hid him three months. Don't all parents think that? Don't all aunts and uncles and all of those who love a child? This is the prettiest child in all of the world, even if the child, you know, maybe is not gonna win any Gerber baby competitions, but this baby was the apple of his parents' eye. I know right now we think about the challenges of parenting and childcare, of teaching, of working in the middle of pandemic and social distancing. Moses's parents weren't trying to hide him to protect him from a virus, but because this baby boy was against the law, <laughs> he was breaking the law by just being alive, by not having been killed under the orders of Pharaoh. Moses's mom, Jochebed, can't imagine keeping him under wraps any longer. <laughs> Three months is long enough to do your life of caring for an older child, Moses' sister Miriam, making dinner, getting water, and doing all of the harsh work of being a slave underneath a cruel, cruel empire. And so Moses' mother, in a last ditch effort, does the only thing that she knows how to do and so Moses' mother, when she could hide him no longer, got a papyrus basket for him. She fixes it up as well as she can to try to make him safe. This is the most aerodynamic, highest technology basket that has ever been basketed. <laughs> she plasters it with bitumen and pitch, and she places that baby boy in that little ark and puts it among the reeds on the bank of the river. And then scripture doesn't tell us what happens. Maybe she can't stand to even look, hoping against hope that somebody who is kind, someone who, in the words of civil rights leader John Lewis, who died this past week, someone who is willing to get into a little bit of good trouble, will come and find this baby boy. Scripture doesn't tell us whether Moses' sister, Miriam, <laughs> who is probably no older than 10 or 12, whether Moses' mom tells her to stand there, or if that's just something that Moses' sister does, because this is something that bossy older sisters do. They like to get into absolutely everything that's not part of their business. She stood at a distance to see what would happen the person who finds this baby in his little baby basket, in his little baby ark, in the reeds of the river, is someone who is willing to be part of a conspiracy to save a life. Someone who is willing to get in the middle of a little bit of good trouble. It's not the person that you think it would be. <laughs> it is the daughter of the man who has made the law making little baby boys illegal. <laughs> it's the daughter of Pharaoh. It's hard to imagine a more unlikely person, but this is how it is. The daughter of Pharaoh who does not go out probably thinking, hmm, can I adopt a child today? The Pharaoh's daughter I wonder if it isn't this moment of being vulnerable that lets down all of her guards, her usual ways of protecting herself. And in it, she becomes a conspirator <laughs> for the cause of freedom. It says this in the scripture, 
In verse five, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. And I wonder if Pharaoh's daughter isn't a model for how we can get into a little bit of good trouble, how we can be uh, partners in God's work of freedom. She could probably goes to the river to bathe as they did back then. She has servants, probably slaves of her own, if we're gonna say it the way it probably was. And yet, when her guard is down, <laughs> Literally, she is bathing. That means that she is vulnerable. Maybe she sees it there with kind of a start. Oh my goodness, there is a baby in this basket. <laughs> Maybe she, um, you know how you do when you are walking and maybe you've got your headphones in, you're going about your life, do, 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 and then something shocks you and you don't quite know how to react next. Maybe it was that moment of vulnerability that made her curious, that made her say, what is this? And so she sends her maid, her servant, possibly her slave, to bring that basket to her. It's a small step. She might say, mm, this basket looks like trouble. I'm not gonna do anything with this. We're just gonna find another spot to bathe and just go right on by. But she doesn't. She takes a curious step. She looks aside, she turns aside. And then the scripture says, when Pharaoh's daughter opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. I wonder how this can be a model <laughs> for those of us who find ourselves in this place where we don't quite know what to do next. I was having a conversation with Pastor Doug over text in which we were talking about how we realized that we were in the top maybe 1.5% of people in the world in terms of the wealth that we have. I don't think of myself as being super independently wealthy. I don't have a yacht. I don't have a private plane. I am certainly um, not someone without car payments and student loan debt, and yet I am probably a lot more like Pharaoh's daughter than I am like Yaakovad and Miriam. I don't have servants, but I do have someone who I can pay to do my taxes. <laughs> I don't live in a palace, but I do live in a place with air conditioning and cable TV and too many channels that I subscribe to. I think, what is my work to do right now? What is my work to do today? <laughs> I think sometimes God sends us circumstances so that we can let down our guard like Pharaoh's daughter did, so that we can be a little bit vulnerable and maybe we can not have giant plans, but we can just do nothing other than say, what is that basket? that is coming down the river at me. Let's look and see what it is. Look at this baby boy, hear him crying and say, what is the next right thing to do? The next right thing for Pharaoh's daughter to do, and I'm using this phrase that I've used over and over from the writer, Emily P. Freeman. It's also from the movie Frozen 2. It's also a word, a phrase that is used by folks in the recovery community. What is the next right thing? And so for Pharaoh's daughter, this person of privilege, as we would say, I know that is kind of a weird word, and yet it's something that Pharaoh's daughter has. If she disobeys this law made by her father, <laughs> he's probably more likely to have mercy on her than Moses' mom or Moses' sister is going to have. Pharaoh's daughter says, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. She doesn't have proof, but she is curious. She uses her eyes and then she thinks, she uses her brain. And then Pharaoh's daughter, the person 
and in the right place at the right time, gets a message from this little girl waiting in the rushes. His sister says, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrews women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter says yes. And so Miriam, smart little girl that she is, maybe a little businesswoman, entrepreneur, prophet, lady pastor in the training, goes and gets Moses's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter says, take this child, nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. And so, because of a mother's act of doing the only thing she can think to do, a sister's cunning, and Pharaoh's daughter's vulnerability, Moses's mother is paid to do the thing that she would be doing normally <laughs> without a law making baby boys illegal. She is nursing this child. She is watching him grow up. She's singing him songs at bedtime and kissing his boo-boos away. Yeah, these women, this little girl, <laughs> this mother, this woman who was a daughter of the king and a baby boy that bought, brought them together. I can't help but think that this couldn't be a model for how some of us can live now. Maybe we can keep our eyes out for these moments in which God is breaking down boundaries and dividing lines. This is normally the part where we end with a story, but I think we've already heard one. So I'll leave you with a couple questions. Right now in this time, what ways, what things are making you more vulnerable? Making you stop and let down your guard so that you can be God's partner in the work of freedom? What ways can you be curious, like Pharaoh's daughter was, looking, turning aside, just maybe to see this little ark, this little basket that's here in the reeds? What can you see? And how is God helping you have compassion, having pity, <laughs> looking at those who are hurting and saying, what is my next step to take? Friends, may, like John Lewis, who stood at the bridge in Selma, may all, like all of those women here in the story today, may you be a holy conspirator for freedom. May you get in a little bit of good trouble. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly to his table, all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and who seek to live in peace with one another. So let us confess our sins before God and one another using the words that are found on your screen. Merciful God, we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbor and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to confess your sins before God in silence.
friends hear the good news, the best news that I can imagine. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and it's a good thing and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You lifted up prophets among your people like Moses, and you lifted up people who could make some holy trouble to free your people and to save his life. His mother, his sister, Pharaoh's daughter, all of those. And you continue to give us our part to play in making your world more free. And so, with all of your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He came to this earth to make us free. And by the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant through water and the Spirit. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us so that we might be free, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his friends and he said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He offered it to them. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we remember these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. And we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. And we say, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Friends, I invite you to take your bread, whatever bread you have, whether it is a simple loaf of potato bread and a little bit of grape juice, or whether it is the fanciest sourdough and wine, that I invite you to um, lift a hand um, toward these things as I lead us in prayer together. Holy God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on all of us gathered here, wherever here might be, for we are all one in your spirit. And on these gifts of bread and juice, Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ. Make us one with each other, gathered throughout time, throughout space, gathered even as we are apart. And make us one in ministry to all of our broken but beautiful world until Christ comes in final victory to make us all free and we feast at his heavenly table. By your spirit, with your Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever, amen. And now friends, as God's children, we invite you to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. And we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to, to take your bread. And I invite you to remember that because we all share in the same loaf, we who are many are one body. The bread which we break is our sharing in the body of Christ. And this cup over which we give thanks is our sharing in the blood of Christ. Friends, after we uh, share in this holy meal, we believe that whatever elements we have gathered together and that are blessed, that these are sacred. They are the body of Christ and the blood of Christ to us. And so whatever you don't consume, I invite you to either eat reverently after the service is over or to return to the earth. I invite you to share with one another and to say the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Or if you are alone in your home, I invite you to hear these words spoken to you. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God.
watching.